chaotic and comedic, these TV scenes are the antithesis of true romance. Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we'll be counting down our picks for the top 10 cringeworthy date scenes on TV. And um, I think our first date tomorrow is going to go awesome, off the charts, um, amazing, up top. Before we begin, we publish new videos every day, so be sure to subscribe for more great content. For this list, we're focusing on would-be romantic small screen dates that quickly spiraled out of control. Hi, I'm Date Mike. Nice to meet me. How do you like your eggs in the morning? Number 10, Rune, Gilmore Girls. What size shoe do you wear? Uh, size 9. 9? Wow. In season 1, Suki St. James takes a proactive approach with her love life and lands a date with Mr. Jackson Belleville. Since Jackson's cousin Rune is in town, Suki looks to Lorelai for assistance, resulting in a double date. But the eccentric Rune has a few issues, as he immediately recognizes an apparent flaw in Lorelai. This woman is tall. That's Lorelai? Yes. Did you see how tall she is? And so, quirky Rune essentially ruins the moment, as Suki and Lorelai try to process it all, and Jackson attempts to minimize the drama. Some men are specific about their dating preferences, and Rune is most definitely one of those special fellows. Suki, let's go um, powder our noses. I need a lot of powder. We'll be right back. Number nine, texting mishap, love. Just let me know. I mean, if you get uncomfortable or anything. The friend zone is never a comfortable place to be, especially for a man like Gus, who inches ever so close to a relationship with the quirky Mickey Dobbs. And so, it's already a bit awkward when he gets set up with Mickey's roommate Bertie, and the date goes south after a rather unfortunate texting snafu. But Gus composes himself and thoroughly pushes the boundaries of acceptable dining banter. You ever get that thing where you don't wipe very well and your asshole's all itchy? In other words, the game is on. Yet Gus's strategy backfires when Mickey colludes with Bertie, leading to a cringeworthy sequence of events between the two disinterested dates. You know, everyone's always like, oh, I don't support the war, but I support the troops. F that. I don't support the troops. Wow, okay. Number eight, fireworks date, the last man on earth. Phil, did you shave your chest? Sure did. Did you shave yours? <laughs> JK. Phil needs to repopulate the earth, and that's because, yes, he seems to be the last man on earth. Unfortunately, there's a bit of friction with his wife Carol and his alluring love interest Melissa. But the group finds a compromise with a scheduled love session, or so it would seem. We think that you should repopulate with Melissa as well. On his big date, Phil begins playing a guitar, which leads not to romantic fireworks, but to literal fireworks. And so, a gentleman named Todd follows the light, so to speak, which gives Melissa another option to consider and completely wrecks Phil's romantic plans. Hey! I'm Todd! Number 7, Worst Date, Master of None. Early in Season 1, Dev needs a date after landing Father John Misty tickets. At first, Alice seems like the ideal companion. Not a bad catch for Dev, actually. But when she breaks out her Eric Cartman impression... No, no, no! You will respect my authority! The Master of None discovers that Alice just may be a bit, um, unique. Goofy as Dev may be, his date's comedy feels a bit over the top. What up, world? It's me, Alice. I'm here at the super secret Father John Misty show. Furthermore, she proves to be a kleptomaniac, too, thus destroying the Father John experience and further irritating poor Dev. Look at that jacket over there. You dare me to steal it? No. For a guy looking for love, this disastrous scenario proves to have a silver lining, as it transitions directly into Dev's relationship with Rachel. She began the night with uh, an aggressive Cartman impression, mm -hmm. and then uh, ended it by being kicked out for stealing someone's jacket. Ugh, brutal. The Cartman's really funny, though. That's what she kept insisting. <laughs> Number six, Man Hands, Seinfeld. Man Hands? The hands of a man. In a season eight episode, Jerry once again has some personal dilemmas. Perhaps the most cringeworthy moment comes when he meets a beautiful woman named Jillian. She's got a massive set of hands, at least according to Jerry, and he can't help but hear every amplified sound when she crunches a big old lobster. As far as deal breakers go, it's surely not the worst flaw to muddle on. Then again, nobody wants to have an awkward dining experience thanks to some meaty paws. Eyelash, make a wish. I don't want to. Make a wish. Okay. <laughs> Didn't come true. For Jerry, the man hands take over his thoughts, 
much like what happened to Elaine when her date took it out in season five. He took it out. <laughs> Number five, full on rapist. It's always sunny in Philadelphia. Are you Charlie Kelly? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am. <laughs> yeah. After learning that Charlie's love interest is getting married, the gang tries to get him back on the dating scene. However, numerous factors contribute to a seriously disturbing appearance, such as severe anxiety and nasty hornet stings. I run into like, like a lot of like hornets in my line of work and I get stung up like bad all over my face. As if that's not bad enough, Charlie fails hard when attempting to describe himself as a philanthropist. I'm a full-on rapist. He's essentially a hot mess, and each spoken word doesn't help matters either. Yeah, this, I, I was r running. But like a true gentleman, Charlie ultimately reveals the truth, thus making his sweaty appearance and poor communication skills just a little bit less offensive. I'm a janitor at a bar. Number four, The Sty, Sex and the City. In a poignant season six episode about personal and professional investments, Carrie Bradshaw decides to simudate. Not only does she have a meeting with Jack Berger, but she also makes time for Mr. Willie Applegate, the nervous graphic designer that rambles on about a sty. Are you looking at my sty? Excuse me? His anxiety doesn't quite suit Carrie's confident demeanor, and the poor guy only gets more rattled when birds land atop his head. He slips, he slides, and it's an all-out fail that leads to an easy investment choice for Miss Bradshaw. Oh. What the, what, what the f <laughs> Number three, stew for two, 30 Rock. How about Saturday? Saturday, uh, okay, I guess that doesn't have to be weird. When Liz Lemon accidentally schedules a date on Valentine's Day, she doesn't waste any time with personal revelations. In fact, she immediately exposes her breast to Dr. Drew Baird which is just the first of many setbacks for the potential couple. Okay, I feel like I should do the right thing here and tell you that your breast has fallen out of your blouse and I can see all of it. Liz also gets caught on the toilet. No! While Drew's past comes up literally when his daughter makes an unexpected cameo. Mom's key in your car. Uh, Bethany, this is Liz. Both Liz and Drew mostly keep it together, however, even if their first date is neither romantic nor well thought out. Liz, you know, my mom did just die. But in the world of 30 Rock, it's just another day for Liz, cringeworthy as it may be. In fact, one could argue that it goes better than her date with Stephen Black. I am not racist. I love black men. I, I love you. This is fantastic. Let's get dessert. Yeah. Death by chocolate. Number two, Rachel and Steve, friends. That, that guy over there is probably saying, ooh, I shout with him. He must be rich. <laughs> In season one, Phoebe introduces Monica to a troubled restaurant owner named Steve, and it does not go well. Give me the gummy bears. I, no. So when Phoebe needed a way to drive Rachel back to Ross, she set up her friend with the same unconfident stoner. Phoebe told me that, uh, that you owned your own restaurant. That's impressive. I lost it. <sighs> to drugs. Rachel plays it cool, but Steve reveals just a bit too much about his past drug use and infertility. And I'm pretty sure I'm infertile. <laughs> in fact, he doesn't seem interested in love at all, as he's more of a self-loathing kind of guy. I, I can't believe I'm crying in front of you. But despite all the negativity and cringeworthy banter, it's still a relative success from Phoebe's perspective even if Rachel didn't know it at the time. I think I know the answer to this question, but would you like to make love to me? <laughs> Number one, for f sake, The Office. Cows have got four stomachs, all right? In the series finale, the always entertaining David Brent lines up a few dates, four to be exact, after two failed engagements, he still seems hopeful. Just a man excited for what could be. Excitement, really. Not sexual, you know. Within seconds, however, positivity turns to negativity as David lays eyes on his blind date and her large white chiffon scarf. Oh, for f It's not the reaction that a woman expects, but it's certainly a classic David Brent moment, given his verbal reaction and non-verbal behavior. She's bleh, nothing. She's not, I mean, not talking about me. Nah. <laughs> Whereas some television shows feature screwball comedy and over the top antics, this cringeworthy scene is straight to the point and paved the way for a classic Michael Scott moment in the American installment. Michael? 
Ah. Are you Michael Scott? Is who Michael what? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm supposed to be meeting someone named Michael. Oh, that's not... Yeah, I'm not... Michael? Michael? Do you agree with our picks? Check out these other great clips from Ms. Mojo and subscribe for new videos every day.